Yes. Welcome to Up In Your Business with Kerry McCoy, a production of FlagandBanner.com. Through storytelling and conversational interviews, this weekly radio show offers listeners first-hand insight in starting and running a business, the ups and downs of risk-taking, and the commonalities of successful people. Connect with Carrie through her candid, often funny, and informative weekly blog, where you'll read and comment on life as wife, mother, daughter, and entrepreneur. And now it's time for Carrie McCoy to get all up in your business. I'm Carrie McCoy, and it's time for me to get up in your business. By that, I mean to say, share my business knowledge and wisdom with you, our listener. This is when I usually introduce another fellow entrepreneur, and we discuss how we maneuvered the path of entrepreneurship in pursuit of our dreams. But today is going to be different. For the first time, we have four people joining me at the table. We're going to talk on one of my favorite subjects, the Dreamland Ballroom. 26 years ago, while driving down the I-630 freeway, I noticed a stately old red brick building falling into disrepair. It seemed to call me, and one day I bravely came down to the abandoned building, wove my way over debris and through hallways to the third floor, and saw the Dreamland Ballroom. It was like a spiritual experience. The roof was off, sun was shining, and birds were flying about. I fell in love. With extra money in Arkansas Flag and Banner's checking account and my growing need for more office space, I began the long process of buying and renovating the building known as the Taborian Hall. Once moved in, old-timers visited me. The building was not just handsome, but also historically significant. Built in 1916 by the Knights and Daughters of Tabor, a benevolent business fraternity with ties to the African Methodist Episcopal Church, also a U.S. Officers Club during World War I and World War II, and a stop on the legendary Chitlin Circuit, my sense of responsibility towards this old building took root. In 2009, the Friends of Dreamland, a nonprofit, was formed to help save and protect the Dreamland Ballroom. It was a lucky day for all of us when AETN took an interest in her and began the process of making a documentary. With me today are the directors and the producers from the AETN documentary, simply titled Dream Land. That's two words. The film is based on the historic past of Ninth Street, an African-American business and entertainment district of the early 1900s, and on the historical significance of the Taborian Hall, a.k.a. the Arkansas Flag and Banner Building, and its famous Dreamland Ballroom, located on the third floor. Today, the Taborian Hall is the only remaining historic structure from the glory days of Little Rock's West 9th Street, known as The Line. This documentary will premiere in two weeks on Friday, March the 31st at 7 p.m. at the CAS Ron Robinson Auditorium in the River Market of Little Rock, Arkansas. The event is free and open to the public. Reservations are available online, and we'll tell you more about that later. But before we start, I want to introduce you to the people at the table. We have Tim Bowen, our technician, who will be taking your calls and pushing the button. Say hello, Tim. Hello, Tim. Here to talk with us today are the producers and the directors of the documentary Dream Land. Welcome to the table, AETN's Dwayne Wilbur, Director of Operations, Tanisha Jo Conway, Creative Director, Casey Sanders, Senior Producer and Freelancer, Wave Over There, Gabe Mahan, Director of Photography for Dreamland. Hello, y'all. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. AETN says about this documentary, and I quote, It seeks to recognize, memorialize, and share the history of West 9th Street and the Dreamland Ballroom, from the spirit and the hard work of the people to the implications of the federal programs, such as urban renewal, school desegregation, the Housing Act of 1949, and the Eisenhower Interstate Program. Which one of you wants to be the first to tell us why you think this story is so important to tell? Well, hello, everybody. I'm Gabe Mahan. I was the director of the film. We started on this journey about three or four years ago in some form of iteration. It kind of started with a different producer 
I was hired by Carol Adenero, and she paired me with Tanisha to get started on this project. And it was something that, from the get-go, was really interesting to me because I honestly had no idea about it. I didn't know anything about 9th Street. I didn't really know anything about the flag building is what I called it. And when I went up there and saw the Dreamland Ballroom, I mean, it just floored me. It was so photographic and, like... So you can tell there's a million stories here. And I was like, I want to know what they are. And so then Tanisha and I started doing our digging and started finding out what the stories were about the building and what the story was around the street. Because I, growing up pretty much here and around Little Rock, I had no idea about 9th Street. Never heard of it. Uh, never even ha- had zero significance to me except a, an exit off I-30 or something like that. And once I read the book... I burn a love into the line and dreamland specifically about the building i was completely floored i had no idea we had such a rich cultural history here that sadly exists only in that building but thankfully at least we have that building and at least we have some kind of a soundboard to bounce off there and still celebrate all those past accomplishments of a hundred year story of african americans living and having a very vibrant wonderful community that was then destroyed and went away through a series of different programs and things that happened. This happened, so this happened. It's never cut white and black. There was, there was a bunch of things that led to the demise of the street. So then the documentary gets into that. And we thought it was really important. I mean, I think that at this time where we're at as a nation, it's really important for us to kind of start looking back to the past and start examining how things came to be and kind of if we want to move forward as any community like any community this this is across the board in the united states or pretty much anywhere you if you want to advance your culture and have a better life for your kids or your grandchildren i think that you have to look to the past and see where those mistakes happened and accept those mistakes and then start some kind of dialogue where you can correct those issues that had basically created something that uh, is affecting your community in a negative light. Boy, that was really well said. What year did we start, Tanisha? Do you remember? Well, I will say we started four years ago. And with AETN, uh, we were fortunate. People bring us ideas for stories. And we were fortunate to get this one with Berna. And I'm sure, Carrie, you were in some of those early conversations. And what ended up happening is we were able to get some grant money from the Arkansas Humanities Council and also the Moving Image Trust Fund. And so that allowed us to be able to go out and tell these stories. As Gabe said, neither one of us were attached in the beginning. And we were asked to come on later on as some things shifted at AETN. And it has been a journey. When we first got the project, I think it was a little bit different in scope. But when you get out there and you start researching and talking to people, the story kind of finds itself. Yeah. And that's what happened, I think, along the way. The story took over. And we had to get out of the way and kind of let that happen. And so four years later, here we are at a point where it's about to get out and people are about to see it and start some of these discussions, like Gabe said, that we need to have. And this is a great time for us to be able to do that. How many people did y'all interview? Oh, my goodness. I know we probably interviewed at least 30 people, but the more amazing part to me is that not only did we interview that many, the hours of the interviews. It's an hour-long documentary, but one interview with Miss Annie Abrams right down the street, the interview itself is eight hours long. Just her single interview is eight hours long. You have to be a long. good listener. <laughs> I know you interviewed me three times, <laughs> and I think I told the same story three times. It happens that way, but you gave us something every single time. It I mean, was that's best what the happens. first time. Was it really? Yeah. When you're nervous, I think things are always better when you're nervous a little bit. I think after I'd said it a few times, I was kind of getting in the flow. So this is a great opportunity for us to take a break. So when we come back, we're going to find out more about AETN and about the people and the businesses that worked and lived on Ninth Street. You're listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy. I'm speaking today with the directors and the producers of the soon-to-be-released AETN documentary, Dreamland. That's two words. We're back, and all of you can take this one. What did you learn from making this film? I know I learned a lot when I watched it with right. you. Uh, I would say the thing that I learned the most from this is just understanding how 
all of the different parts and pieces of Little Rock's urban scene fit together. I moved here to Central Arkansas back in the early 90s and didn't grow up in this area, but I always heard parts and pieces about what happened at Central High or different things that came in through the history, but not ever heard it in a way where all the parts and pieces were in one story. And this one is. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of people are going to be surprised when they find out that Little Rock in Arkansas was modern and sympathetic to the African-American community after the Emancipation Proclamation and that African-Americans walked to Little Rock from all over the South because of Little Rock's modernization and liberal mindset. Yeah, that was true. But again, you have to understand that world as far as what was considered a moderate Uh, As far as the relationships between African Americans and whites back then, I mean, it's still in Jim Crow South, and it was still segregated, and there's still separate but equal laws across the board, and it was still a repressive society. But, yeah, you're exactly right. It was interesting to find that out of the slave states, Little Rock and Arkansas was considered for a time to be that way. And then, of course, as you watch the documentary, I feel like I'm quoting Berna right now in the documentary. I hope Berna's uh, listening. Yeah, things do, they change. And people say you have to walk through fire before you can be cleansed and things can happen. And that's kind of what we get into. We get into the reasons why the civil rights movement came in stages and waves from these people going, specifically wars, is what kind of catapulted each time. And then you get to desegregation and all that and how it basically impacts the society that we live in today. How Little Rock is seemingly split down the middle into two different cities, south of 630 and north of 630. And an understanding, I guess, the, the comment that I made in the previous section when we were talking about to learn from our mistakes is to understand that the makeup of our city, the racial geography of our city didn't just happen. There was some intent on preserving a way of life because of people's prejudices and those people being afraid of the change. And we have to keep in mind, too, when we're looking back through the eyes of history and looking at these people who made these decisions, it's really easy to see where they made mistakes. But that was the way that things were. That was the only world that they knew. But to continue that, that's the problem. That would be the mistake. That would be the mistake, especially being able to look back and say, this is a mistake. And you're like, well, what are you going to do about it? So what's the documentary going to do, do you think? Do y'all think this documentary is going to do something for that healing? How do you think it's going to affect people? I think it does. I think that one thing we always have to go back and look at is that it's history. I mean, sometimes history is hard to watch. Sometimes history is hard to hear. Sometimes stories are hard to tell. And, you know, you have a little bit of all of that, I think, when you think about dreamland two words or dreamland one word. Mm -hmm. You know, you think about the great times that they had upstairs in the ballroom, and you're absolutely right. You can absolutely feel it. So all of that is there. But you also think about the fact that they had to be in this certain area. African Americans, you know, why did they have to be in this certain area to begin with? So you always have this this back and forth, this pull and tug, you know, and you have to think about all of that. I mean, the fact that the businesses, you're talking about all up in in business. I mean, they created these businesses, these wonderful businesses, these one, whether it was clubs or attorneys or doctors or lawyers or fraternal organizations or whatever. So you have all of this history that a lot of people driving by there will never even think about. They just don't think about it. I do Martin Luther King um, Day at Dreamland, and we do tours for the high schoolers that want to go out and do service work on Martin Luther King Day, and they don't have a clue about their history. I remember it, because I'm probably the oldest person at the table, and I remember Ninth Street. It wasn't the Ninth Street that's in this documentary. It was after its fall, but I am amazed at how many African-American children do not know anything about their grandparents and I tell them to go home and talk to their grandmother about it and in a way I'm kind of glad in a weird sort of way I'm kind of glad they don't 
care or know about it. I think you're absolutely right. And that's one of the things people can learn from this documentary is to go home and have those conversations. It doesn't matter, you know, which side, black, white, whoever's seeing it. Those conversations are important for oral histories, but not just for oral histories, but for moving forward. You know, you need to know. I mean, there's so many things that get brought up in this documentary that we're facing now. There are things about education in this documentary. You know, there are some things going on in education in Little Rock and across the board. There are things about highways. There are plans for different highways in this area right now. So all those things come to bear, and we need to know that in order to move forward and make some decisions on how we're going to move forward. So that's one of the things that I think both of us really hope that people can get from this documentary. And how many stories are there? There is a West Ninth Street in so many other cities across not just Arkansas but other states. They're, they're everywhere, and our research shows that. And so it's time that we uncover those stories and air them out a little bit and tell them and, and grow and learn from them. So Do you think you can make a nationwide release of this documentary? Do you think that this documentary, since it did happen all over the country, I mean, we've talked about it, the three of us before, about Harlem and Watts was all the thriving black business districts before the 60s? We hope so. So are you going to use what you learned and then go to those cities, or are you going to just kind of expand it? How are you thinking about I know we've talked about doing it nationally. Have you got a plan for maybe trying to expand it into maybe? Well, there are several avenues, and we'll explore them kind of as we go. We'll get a release. We're hoping to get in some film festivals around, you know, around in in other states and that sort of thing. And then, of course, AETM being a part of PBS. Mm -hmm. We'll check with PBS and APT and NIDA and all the resources that we have to try to get it outside of Arkansas's border. But will it be the same Arkansas Little Rock story, or will it... Or will we add to it and talk about combine some stuff that's got to do with their It'll cities? It'll be this story. But, okay. you know, I think the story as it is will resonate. You did? You know? Well, let me – look, Dwayne's over here shaking his head. What are you going to say, Dwayne? Definitely it, it will be this story that we share, whether that's through the PBS system or any other type of syndication. Uh, but that doesn't mean that wherever this program is shared that they can't do a program around it as well. Uh, A lot of times when we do programs, we'll come on after it is aired and do some kind of call-in program or some kind of expert panel discussion. And if this program is shared at other PBS stations, they can then do that and talk about their specific street in their area. So that's probably how it could be shared. Is it going to be at the film festival in Hot Springs this year? Probably. I hope so, yeah. I mean, and that's kind of the, the, the goal of this, though, like to get out and to get people talking, right? Because... This is not just something that's unique to Little Rock. It's not, unfortunately. It's it's everywhere. Yeah. And so it's like, crack the egg open and let's let's get these things going. You know, let's talk about it. And that's what a good documentary should do. And we're not trying to be vague with that answer. Uh, we just don't have any confirmation that any of those things are going to happen. But that is our hope. So, is there anything that was surprising to you in these stories that you heard besides the one I just? I mean, there was a lot really to me. So the one about Little Rock being sympathetic to the African-American plight. And then the other one I thought was interesting is that there were more African-American senators. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's the great thing about this documentary. I think that it's going to give, and it's not just African-Americans, it's going to give us a pride as Arkansans um, to understand, like, that we had at one time something that was very unique in America. Like, when uh, after the Civil War and during Reconstruction, we had more African-American senators, I believe, than any other state at the time. And, unfortunately, we haven't had that many since, but this little area, 9th Street, was massively progressive. Like, and it was massively successful. It was so successful that in 1950, there was a quote in Ebony Magazine talking about Memphis's Bill Street, which we all know Memphis's Bill Street now, about how... As far as an African-American business district, Memphis Bill Street was just kind of decaying and not a great place to be. And use that in direct contrast to Little Rock's West Ninth Street, which was a shining example of what an African-American business district could be. Is Bill Street important to Memphis? Yes. It is. You talk about business, it's the thriving heartbeat and cultural identity of Memphis. And we had something that was bigger and better than that here. And for those types of mistakes to be made, you know, and not being able to see 
because of prejudice and because of people's fear and thinking in the box, it's sad. You know, it's sad that we kind of missed the boat on that. But it doesn't mean that we're just going to sit around and cry over spilt milk. That's the reason this documentary has to have legs and it has to start these conversations to start building a bridge back over the I-30 split. And we always have had an opportunity to make this community something special and something unique because honestly, Little Rock's small enough to do it because it's a community of 200,000 people. It's not like you're dealing with like a Chicago that's like 10 million people, which that's a big task. But here, you could really do something, right? I mean, you really, really could. And it starts... And ends, and Tanisha and I were talking about this today, I wish we would have had time for the documentary to get where it obviously gets into is the education system. Because that's where it's going to start with. It's going to start with improving the public schools in this town and being able to somehow find a way to have that community spirit that rallies around a public school system that's good and that's educating people and people want to come back here and live. You're right about it being a very well expensive and well to do because I think the DeBorean Hall, my building, was one of the most expensive, if not the most expensive building in Little Rock when it was built. It was over a million dollars Yep. in 1916 when they built my building. So that they had of, a lot of money flowing That blew me there. away, kind of. Yeah. It, it apparently turned over about eight times just in that community. The dollar turned around like eight times. You should Can have you seen imagine? the title when I cleaned it up. Speaking of that building turning over, that title was long by the time I got it. What was that, almost 80 years later? So were there any surprises besides those stories? I think it may have hit on all of them. There were a lot of surprises along the way, but I think the main thing is just allowing people to tell their truth and their stories and their perspectives. I don't think we realized, you know, what would happen when somebody finally, I say they exhaled and said it's okay to talk to them. There were so many personal stories that aren't necessarily in the film, but you know, when you start talking to a person and they start getting into when I was a child, there you when right. I climbed the fire escape, when I did this to hear the music, when I went, you know, when we went shopping on 9th Street, when I went to get my hair cut. And so it was like we never knew what those personal stories were so amazing. And they, all of them, of course, couldn't make it <laughs> into the film, but I think people finally felt heard, the ones that we could get to. They felt like, you know, somebody finally took an interest in sharing those stories, and that was just amazing to be a part of. And that's why we hope, we hope, we hope that people will take that on and start saying, let's do some oral histories. That whether it's the Butler Center or wherever we can get people in to start telling these stories, because that creates more of a wealth of knowledge. I mean, you know, we have Mr. John Kane here. He was gracious enough to interview with us and tell us a lot about the history of the area. And the last thing I'll say on that part is when you think about this doc was an hour, but it could have gone on so many other hours. Right, I was going to ask you, you (laughs) wanted it to be two hours long. You know, because you could take off and do an hour on just the music. I mean, the performers that came through Taborian Hall or 9th Street, you could go off and take off and do a whole story on just the other businesses. You could do a story on, you know, how everything was managed, how it was laid out. You could do a story on Mosaic Templars. Yeah. You, I mean, there are so many that could go on and go on, and that's what we hope people continue to tell those stories and continue to have a dialogue. That's a great time for us to segue into playing some music, and then we'll come back and talk about some of the people that played there. We'll find out more about the businesses that were there. And we also want to save time at the end of this to talk to AETN about their specials they've got going on right now. They've got a filmmaking contest, a writing contest. They've got something for the kids to do at the Discovery Museum over the spring break. So we don't want to miss out on talking about some of the other great things that AETN. We've got a caller. Hello, you're on the air. Uh, yes, this is Carrie. Hey, this is Carrie McCoy. Hi, Hi. this is Sam. Um, I love your show, Thank by you. the way. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question for your guest. I had heard on, I can't remember what program it was, but sometime on KBF or somebody that is involved with Mosaic Templars Museum was talking about making a virtual tour, uh, like a virtual reality tour of 9th Street. And I wonder if they had heard anything about that or had thought about yeah. aiding and piecing that together. I love that idea, and yes, I've heard about that. Yes, I worked with Mosaic Templar, but they've had several executive directors down there, but one of them 
and I worked together about making a walking tour that would be a virtual reality down there, but I think we'd have to get a grant, and you know I have to run Arkansas Flag and Banner, so I'm having a Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I, I love know, that I, idea. I know you're busy. I know you're, yeah. yeah I love yeah. that okay. idea. I hope my board members are listening. Somebody needs to write a grant for that. I think that's a great idea, and you know, the city would just really, really benefit from having something like that for people that come to visit us. Thanks for calling. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. I know. I love and that. I think there are some people who are working on mapping that out. I mean, really? And so we'll talk about that. But I think there's some of that going on. We're working it out. And also, just to say, the Mosaic Templars, after the event mm-hmm. on Friday the 31st at the Ron Robinson, on that Saturday, there will be a walking tour of 9th Street that's being sponsored by Mosaic Templars at 1 p.m. So you can go down to Mosaic Templars on the 1st, April 1st. And they're going to do a walking tour at 1 p.m. of West 9th Street. I did not know so. that. So the premieres at Ron Robinson at 7 o'clock on March the 31st right, on, that, on, on the Friday. Friday night. Uh-huh. And then on April the 1st, you can go to Mosaic Templar at 1 o'clock and get the actual walking tour. Oh, good. Good to know. And if you can't make it to the, uh, the, the premiere on March 31st, the premiere on A10 will be April the 6th at 7 p.m. So it will broadcast on April 6th. It's going to be on TV. And the 17th, I think, too, right? That's if right. You, Repeat you, on April 17th. And I bet it comes on more than that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it will. So you also have another show called Front Row. And you had the Wildflowers. We did. And this is Casey Sanders now. She's going to put on the headset and talk to us. You're the senior producer at AETN. That means I'm old. You've got a long history, though, of doing great things with the Hot Springs Film Festival. That's right. And you are also doing the front row, and you did the Wildflower Review. Right. And can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Our music show is called AETM Presents on the Front Row, and we've been doing it for around 11, 12 years. And it started out in our studio, and we did it for many years out of our studio. All Arkansas musicians, everything from jazz, folk, We even had rock. We had go fast. We had had everything in our studio. And then we decided a couple of years ago to get out of the studio, and we partnered with Ryan Harris at the Oxford American at South on Main, and we did a series of shows there, kind of testing the waters on getting us out of the studio and using a little bit smaller footprint and going into venues. And that worked beautifully. We have a series of programs from South on Main that are wonderful and we're really pleased with them but one of the places that I kind of had my eyes set on after I helped out I'm kind of a fan and on the sidelines of the Dreamland documentary my office is right next door to Tanisha and I've known Gabe for years and I've sort of watched them as they took I mean I think they told you 30 interviews one of them was eight hours long you can imagine the amount that they had that they had to boil down into the story that they're telling and uh, so I've been kind of on the sidelines of that but I got to help out during the reenactments and we had Rodney Block and we had all these wonderful people come in to Dreamland and the ballroom to do these reenactments and kind of thought well why can't we do a music program that's now and lo and behold Kim Swink and her husband Chris Spencer put together the Wildflower Review CD release party. And Wildflower Review is Amy Garland Angel and Mandy McBride and Bonnie Montgomery and then all of their amazingly talented friends that came in for their CD release party. And we kind of united with them because they were already doing some audio and some lighting and some camera work and then we came in with extra cameras and shot an hour's worth of music there in dreamland it was january 21st and tanisha and i talked about it and it's kind of like with this documentary there's so many things that come out of it but one thing is is can we bring some vibrancy again and doing a music show that's current there in dreamland was a teensy little bit of that and um, it was an amazing night it looked beautiful Gosh, it sounded beautiful and we're currently working on that show We don't have it set for air yet. We're still actually kind of swapping footage back and forth between the two teams that shot it. But we've got high hopes for that program. It was a beautiful night. The lighting was beautiful. I was wondering if you were going to add some of that wildflower review to the Dreamland documentary. No? You didn't go back and put any on it? 
Because you wanted They're at picture lock. They're, t- <laughs> They're at picture lock. Is that, what, is that technical terms? <laughs> yes, picture lock? That means... <laughs> done, it's, done. So you had somebody edit the Dreamland from California. Yeah, my friend Lucas Morales, who honestly, I cannot say enough about that guy because it was insane. We had so much footage to go through and I felt like the story had to be told by the people that are in it. And basically what that means is there's not going to be any voiceover. It's just going to be the people that are interviewed, the ones that are telling the story. Few people have seen it. Yeah. And And tell me what they did. The first thing they did was stand up and scream, how did y'all do that? That was the most overwhelming thing that we heard. And of course, these two down here at the end just can do unbelievable things with the tools that they have. So a lot of the credit goes to them. But we've been very, very overwhelmed with the amount of support that we've gotten from the people that have watched it. What was the second thing they did? They cried. Oh, yes. Well, I cry every time I watch it. I've probably watched it 50 times at this point, and I cry every time I watch it. And it's at a different place every time. I uh, can't explain why. Just soft that way, I guess. There's a spot. I can almost repeat this documentary verbatim, but there's a spot that gets me every single time. Every time. Every time it's like, ah, I'm going to walk out now because I know this is coming up. <laughs> Which spot? You have to come and watch it. <laughs> you sent a uh, five-minute clip over for us to watch to review a year ago, and my husband watched it, and he cried. My husband never cries and stuff like that. I was like, why are you crying? He goes, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's the exact same thing. I don't know. Maybe I've heard it so many times, I'm just calloused. So let's talk, since we're talking about on the front row, let's talk about some of the music that played in the Dreamland Ballroom and about what the Chitlin Circuit is. I didn't know what it was till I moved down there. Oh, my. The Chitlin Circuit, of course, it was, it was places where African-American performers could perform when they couldn't get into the other venues. There, there was this circuit that they would travel from state to state to state, and we were fortunate to be on that, and several played at the Dreamland Ballroom. But, I mean, you have Memphis, you have Birmingham, you have, you know, all these places that had their own, their own little, little club, little place that they would go and play. And one of the interesting things to me has always been, when you think about the music, of West 9th Street and you think about a lot of times they came to play the Robinson Auditorium. So they were here to play the Robinson and the same audience of course couldn't go to the Robinson and so they would then come down to 9th Street and play all night long. I've heard heard some stories. Over that it was all night long and musicians would come in and sit in and play and um, one of the things Gabe and I were talking about earlier as well was uh, with like Duke Ellington. He came in to play and, and got stranded here in Arkansas and ended up being here for a couple of weeks. And so you think about the people who housed him, the people who got to sit and just hear him play. I've never heard that story. Tell me. Hear him play. It it was just that. He came in town to play and couldn't get out of town because of an issue with transportation. The issue was he lost his bus gambling. (laughs) Oh, say that again, Gabe. He lost. (laughs) That's what we heard. I mean, you never know. Like, that's what's so wonderful about these stories is like, they take on, hopefully, they take on a, a life of their own and become like these really big grand... You know, it's been 60 years, 60, 70 years since the, all these stories that we're going to talk about in this documentary have happened. So any good storyteller, they're going to take it and put their little spin on it. And I, I personally think that's a fantastic spin. <laughs> and he said that he got stranded because he gambled away his... Yeah, he gambled. Supposedly, he lost, uh, he lost, well, he lost his bus in Hot Springs gambling. And then his band left him, and he crewed up here and played Dreamland enough times to get some money to get another bus or something to get out of town. (laughs) I love it. So some of the people that played there are Duke Ellington. I didn't realize Little Richard played there until I read it today. B.B. King, Ray Charles, Count Basie, Sarah Vaughn. Nat King Cole. I mean, the list is unbelievable. And, and you know, the, the one thing that I think we'd be remiss if we didn't say about the musicians is that we talk about the national musicians, but there were so many local, wonderful musicians in Arkansas that played up and down that street. I think that, you know, we have to, to make sure that people know that Arkansas had wonderful, wonderful Sister musicians. Rosetta Tharp. Yes. Louis Jordan. Louis Jordan. Jordan. Al, Al Hibber. Oh, Wasn't he from about Arkansas? Lord Armour. Oh. Lord Armand, you think about there just mm-hmm. so many Art Porter. You think about yeah. all the people who played there, and there were these wonderful Arkansas folks who got a chance to play 
by themselves and then also with the national acts and I think that it's great that we get to celebrate that as well. So you can come out and see the documentary on the 31st. You can also watch it on TV on AETN. I am a huge lover of AETN. I probably watch it more than any other channel. And I have Netflix and Amazon Prime, and I can watch anything I want. And I watch AETN more than any of them because I love the traveling Arkansas. I love the biographies about famous people. And I hope someday I get to be in one of those when I'm dead and gone. I think about that. See it. Like I've got to do something great before I die, so I can be on the documentary. <laughs> and then we didn't talked about the knights and daughters of Tabor built the Taborian Hall, and they were a big deal. I didn't even know about this African American business fraternity with this social responsibility of providing burial insurance and taking care of widows and orphans. It was really kind of our first welfare system. And I've been told, and see if this rings true with you through storytelling that it's really what we model our current welfare system after is what these knights and daughters of Tabor did. Well, we've heard that and also the fact that they couldn't go anywhere else to get these and so they built their own. The fraternal organizations, Mosaic Templars, Knights and Daughters of Tabor. So these were the organizations that they could go to to buy burial insurance and what they needed because they couldn't get it anywhere else. And so it's another thing about the self-sufficiency of the people of that area, whether they were out building businesses or hospitals and you know they had to do all of that and the Knights and Daughters of Tabor as well as Mosaic Templars and other organizations helped to give them a bedrock of what they needed for that area to function. There were doctors. There were doctors, there were lawyers, there were grocers, there were barber shops, there were beauty salons, there, there were, were bankers, confectioners, stable yards. It was it was all there. The theater, the gym theater was probably one of the most spectacular theaters in Little Rock. It was a complete city. It had to be a complete city within a city. But it was just those eight or nine blocks. Everything was there. Like, everything. Their entertainment, their churches, their hospitals, their business, everything. Everything existed on that street, and that's pretty amazing. So, that, and it's also the idea that it had to be allocated in that one area. There's going to be some romance about this. Like, we're going to romanticize it, but let's not forget that it had to just be in these blocks. These people were a repressed society, but look at what they did inside of that. So when does the documentary end? What decade does it end? At the end of the 50s? Well, no, I mean, we bounce back and forth. We have kind of like this little motif that happens. We have these things that, these little devices that bring us back out to present day. You're actually one of them that comes out and shows what the life of the street is, how some of these people that were affected by this relocation have dealt with business relocation and and the spread. And then also, unfortunately, I'm glad you actually brought this up, we lost one of our key players in the documentary. Who? Leon. (gasps) Majors died, yeah. No! Yeah. When? Earlier this week. I didn't know. Oops, I'm sorry. That's all right, that's all right. Oh, He's been with me since the day I bought that building. I may cry. Yeah, he's a big deal. He was a big deal. He was a big deal for the street. He was a living and breathing part of Ninth Street that we had the fortunate time of interviewing. And there's a segment in there that he's in. And unfortunately, we did lose him. And he was 95, 96 years old. And he was a staple at the Arkansas State Capitol. That's right. He went there every day. And he was such a character. Every time we tried to interview him, he always thought the police were still trying to find him for gambling. And he was so (laughs) hard. I had to call him up and go, Leon, they are not going to arrest you. Come down here. We're going to immortalize you forever. And I had to do a lot of interviews with him because his teeth clacked when he talked and I was like the only person that could understand him when he talked. So I saw on the documentary where y'all voiced y'all did, uh, yeah. what is that where you, huh? Subtitles, Subtitles on him because nobody can understand him. He's, uh, he's beautiful. And, and we're so proud that we were able to preserve his oral history uh, and got his perspective on what happened on Ninth Street. And again, we need to reemphasize that, you know, we're talking about how As we've gone through our lives and learned about the history of Arkansas, we're surprised that this community existed right there on 9th Street. But it happened in every community. Every other town had a 9th Street. So we can't say that enough. So we hope that that's what people can take away from this program, that they need to take time to understand these stories and just don't take things at face value. Find out what happened in your community and decide to get involved. 
Well, I have a question. Sure. For my two buddies next door here. Um, so this kind of brings up the fact that you've got so many hours of stories with these wonderful folks. Are we going to do something with the oral histories that you didn't get to use in the documentary? We hope so. Now, exactly what that's going to be, we don't know. We don't know what that's going to look like. But we would love to do that because, like we said, the personal stories, a lot of the personal stories are within those. You know, there may be a way, of course, we'll archive them. But as far as how we're going to present them or put them out, we, we haven't decided that yet. But um, there are so many stories in there that are worth telling. And Mosaic and, Timbers could probably house yeah. all that information for you. They're yeah. doing a good job down there. Yeah, so we hope to do something. We just don't know quite yet. And the one that I wished we'd have gotten that none of y'all got to meet was the very first gentleman that ever came to see me, Max Honeycutt. He owned the Honeycutt uh, Hotel that was right next door to me, and he came down. Those older gentlemen were such gentlemen. He was such a gentleman. And and I was sitting at my desk, and I'd only been there maybe a month, and I look up, and he's got both of his hands up to his eyes, and he's up against the glass, and he's looking through the glass trying to see inside. And I jump up, and I run out there, and I tell him who I am, and he starts telling me, all about his wife and his business and he takes me around the corner to Izzard Street and he shows me where he and his wife laid the tiles that walked up to the front porch of his house and then he tells me a story about the history of the black community after desegregation and this was something I never thought of was that the desegregation was wonderful but a lot of his patrons quit shopping in the Ninth Street stores and that unknowingly it was kind of like Walmart came to town and all the African Americans began to shop over on Main Street because they could and it was a little bit less expensive because they had larger buying power and they unknowingly bankrupted a lot of their businesses and that he talked a little bit about that but I'd never heard that part of the story there's just so much to tell that's so true there's so many different angles We've got to talk about some of your great projects. AETN searching for aspiring young filmmakers. Yeah. There's a deadline to enter. March 31st. That's just around the corner. It is, but there's always there's opportunities all the way through the year. So I don't want people to think, oh, March 31st, I don't need to keep listening because we have all kinds of opportunities past March 31st. But it's Student Selects, and that's a Young Filmmaker Showcase. And I've got a bunch of partners, and what we do is... AETN opens, basically, we just open up, we would like to see student films that have been created for kids. I mean, kindergarten through high school. I mean, if we have somebody in kindergarten that actually tries to make a little film, we want to see it. And we have had a kindergartner send in a submission, and we've actually broadcast something by a third grader. It's primarily middle school and high school, and we just like to get and highlight the student filmmakers and get their work seen beyond the classroom. And then we partner with lots of folks. The Thea Foundation offers scholarships. I've got four $2,500 scholarships for filmmakers in cinematography, screenwriting, editing, and directing. Is that for the March 31st deadline? Mm-hmm. And I have a partner that is the Arkansas Department of Heritage and the Arkansas History Preservation Program. That's a cash prize that they offer for students making films on historical sites, 50 years or older. And so they're trying to support historical documentaries about a historical site, which is what we're just talking about. (laughs) And so we're trying to support young filmmakers getting started doing this. And then I have a new partner this year, and it's Central High National Historic Site, and they also have a cash prize. And this is tied in with their 60th anniversary. So the 60th anniversary of the Central High Crisis that's coming up next year. So they're supporting students making films about civil rights, uh, possibly looking at someone who has um, inspired them, but we're looking forward and what is the change that they want to see. Mm -hmm. So Central High, like a lot of our talk today, is about looking back at history and being informed by history but looking at where we are now and what can we do now and so this is our area where we're encouraging Arkansas's youngest filmmakers to really look at some of these issues and 
provide an incentive because schools don't support this kind of filmmaking across the board. I mean, a lot of times there's a journalism class or a broadcasting, or they might do a PSA or something like that. And this is a little broader than that, a little beyond that. So the cash prizes and the scholarships, you know, are very important. We also partner with film festivals, and we take student films to film festivals to get them seen by a larger often an international audience. Wow. And we partner with the film festivals to put them together with professional filmmakers. Gabe has done this several times. He's taught workshops for middle school and high school students here in Little Rock, and and it's wonderful to connect young filmmakers with professional filmmakers. It's great if they come in, but it's also great to show them that we have filmmakers right here in Arkansas that are making a living, and they're able to actually do professionally we got a lot of art. filmmakers in Arkansas. I'm kind of surprised. Good ones. I saw Loving. It was good. Uh, oh, that's good. I'm sorry, that wasn't yours, Gabe. Gabe, no. you've got some, you're a rock star. I've known Gabe for a while. I have no idea. You've got three movies coming out. There you go. Well, there is. My day job, I'm a cinematographer. So, oh, yeah. Let me call you that. Um, let me call you the right thing. So, no, I mean, director of photography and cinematographer are the same thing. But this is Dreamland was the second time I've directed something that long. As a cinematographer, I shot the movie Greater, which was a very Arkansan Citric movie. It was about the football player Brandon Burlesworth. And then released, I guess, limited release theatrically last year as well was a film I shot in California called Lazy Eye. And it's set in Joshua Tree, California. And that's available like on iTunes and things of that nature. And it was released in New York and L.A. And theatrically. And then... You shot one with Joey Lauren Adams recently. Yep. So there was a a film I shot with uh, Paul Sparks and Joey Lauren Adams. It's not been released yet, though. It's not been released, but it looks like it's going to be released this year. It's called All the Birds Have Flown South. And then I just finished this past fall shooting a film called Antiquities that was written by my good friend and directed by Daniel Campbell and co-written with Graham Gordy. Mary Steenburgen. Mary Steenburgen. Rick St. Vincent, my friend Rick St. Vincent. Rick St. Vincent's in it. He's coach. He's a, he's a Dreamland Ballroom board member. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Ashley Green from the Twilight movie and Andrew West from Walking Dead were the stars of that. All right, let's go back to AETN. Uh, you've got a writer's contest coming up, don't you? April the 7th? Um can't say that I have a whole lot of information on that. That's done with our marketing and outreach department. So if you want to call AETN or go to our website, AETN.org, the phone number is 501-682-2386, and someone there can get you any of the information on that contest. But it is coming up. And next week, AETN is partnering with the Discovery Museum for all the kids that are out of school. Y'all got a lot going on down at the museum. Let's see. There's Daniel Tiger, Curious George, PBS Kids. Oh, and then you've got a petition you can go and sign about the political action, about the president's budget, and the proposal to eliminate funding for public media. If you want to sign that petition, you can go on AETN, right? I'm going because I love AETN. And you've got a new executive director or a new director, Courtney. She's coming on. So that happens in just a few days, I think. Doesn't she start in just a Tuesday? Monday. Monday or Tuesday. Monday or Tuesday's her first day. So it's time for us to go. Anything you want to say last before we leave? If you're interested in coming on the 31st to the Ron Robinson, you actually have to go to their website, which is ArkansasSounds.org. ArkansasSounds.org. It's free. It's absolutely free, but they just need to keep track of how many people are coming. You can make reservations. So you can go there and make reservations so that they can keep account of folks that are coming and you can get a little ticket. So please do that. We'd love to see you there. And I had my people put a link on the top of the Flag and Banner website. So if you go to flagandbanner.com, there's a link up at the top that will give you all the AET information about when it's airing on TV and how to get tickets. So they should have that all up and posted. I want to thank y'all all for being here today. Thank you for having me. Thank you, thank y'all, you so much. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Y'all lent so much credibility to Dreamland and what's going on down there. And the credibility goes towards the Friend of Dreamland's mission statement, which is healing our community through music, history, and the party of Dreamland. So y'all are really helping us do that. Thank y'all very, very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. And now for the closing. 
this was not really an entrepreneurial story, but Gabe is an entrepreneur. And if you've got a great entrepreneurial story you would like to share with me, I would love to hear from you. Send me a brief bio and your contact info to questions at upyourbusiness.org, and someone will be in touch. And finally, to our listeners, thank you for spending time with me. If you think this program has been about you, you're right, but it's also been about me. Thank you for letting me fulfill my destiny. My hope today is that you've heard or learned something that's been inspiring or enlightening and that it, whatever it is, will help you up your business, your independence, or your life. I'm Carrie McCoy, and I'll see you next Friday at 2 p.m. on KABF Radio in Little Rock, Arkansas. Until then, be brave and keep it up. You've been listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy, a production of FlagandBanner.com. If you miss any part of the show or want to learn more about UIYB, go to flagandbanner.com and click on Radio Show. Like us on Facebook or subscribe to her weekly podcast wherever you like to listen. All interviews are recorded and posted the following week with links to resources you heard discussed on today's show. Underwriting opportunities available upon request. Carrie's goal is to help you live the American dream. Oh,